Elizabeth, sit up. I want you to go close that door for me real, real quick and then come back over here and sit down. All right, so this evening we're going to be wrapping up the series that we've been going over about the Ten Commandments. So I've been preaching all the Ten Commandments of various order and, and um, you know, jumped around quite a bit. But this evening I'm going to wrap it up. There's two commandments left that I haven't covered, Commandments 3 and Commandments 5. So I'm kind of going to just split the sermon in half. I'm going to preach the first half on um, taking the Lord's name in vain. And then I'm going to switch over, switch gears to, to honoring your father and your mother. Now, I preach an entire sermon on honoring thy father and mother so just, just over a year ago. So I'm, that's why I'm kind of condensing these two together. Um, but we're finishing up that story, the, the, the Ten Commandments. Obviously, very important section of Scripture. Um, a lot of people think they're extremely important because they believe you have to follow them to be saved. Obviously, we know that's not true. Salvation's by grace through faith. But it doesn't mean that the law is just like meaningless and just completely done away with. No, God's law is important for us as Christians to follow today. The Ten Commandments, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain. God still doesn't want you taking the Lord's name in vain just as much as He wants you honoring your father and mother. Okay? So we're going to cover these today. It's something that's very important for us to learn. And um, I'll just read from you out of Exodus 20. We started in Leviticus 24. Stay there. But in Exodus 20, the, the, the verse, verse 7 is the one that, that gives us the commandment about taking the Lord's name in vain. In verse 7 it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, the reason why we start off in Leviticus 24 is because it covers blasphemy. And what people often do is they confuse taking the Lord's name in vain with blaspheming the name of the Lord. And they're actually two different things. So I want to cover a little bit more about blasphemy to start off with because I think this is what people commonly think of when they think of the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. And they typically, what they're considering is blaspheming the name of the Lord. Now, blaspheming the name of the Lord is very serious as well. And we're going to see that, how serious God treats that in Leviticus chapter 24. Look at verse number 10. And it gives us this story. It says, And the son of, his, of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. So there's these two guys getting a fight. One guy is a, is a child of Israel. I mean, he's, he's a, a pure blood, if you will, right? He's, he's, he's you know, um, just a man of Israel. This other one, though, his mother was a, a, a daughter of Israel, but his, his father was um, an Egyptian. And, you know, the, the, they were under the command back then to not marry and intermingle among the heathen. Now, of course, if they came and, and converted unto worshiping the Lord, that wasn't a problem. But, um, you know, from the way that the story reads, it doesn't seem like that was the case. It sounds like He's got an unbelieving dad and his mom's of Israel and he ends up blaspheming God, right? I mean, he's taken after his father and this is one of the reasons why God didn't want them intermingling among the heathen. And to put it just in today's terms, and that's not what this sermon's about, but just to put it in today's terms, you know, Christians ought not to be marrying non-Christians. Especially, you know, in a situation of, a, and it doesn't matter either way, man, woman, woman, man, um, but the, the father is typically the leader in the family. So Christian women that get married to these unsaved men, well, guess what's going to happen to your children? You know, dad's going to have a real strong influence on how they're being raised and how they're growing up. And just like this man, he ends up blaspheming the name of God. You know, his dad had no respect unto the Lord. They didn't teach him any respect. And what he ends up doing is blaspheming and cursing God. And, and this is one of the definitions that we'll have of blaspheming. It's not the only thing you can do to blaspheme the name of the Lord, but he cursed. Right? So saying a curse towards God or about God is blasphemy. When you just are cursing the name of the Lord. Right? Um, that is blasphemy. So 
they don't know what to do with this guy because they hear it's like, whoa, you know, they get in a fight and he curses God. And they're like, whoa, you know, what are we going to do with this guy? So they, they basically throw him in jail for a night. They said they put him in a ward. So they arrest him and that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. So they, they go to God and they're like, God, what do you want us to do with this guy? You know, he blasphemed your name. And it's important. Look, they went to get the mind of the Lord. And we're going to see what the mind of the Lord is. You know, you might think this is extreme. You might not like what, what he said or whatever, but this is the mind of the Lord. These are his words. This is what he thinks about this. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now what we're going to read is God's words, specifically. The Lord said this unto Moses. Verse 14, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. As well the stranger as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. God put the death penalty on cursing God's name, on blaspheming God. This is, is a serious sin, obviously. I mean, if, if, if you're going to be saying you have to put someone to death, and I like the way that God handles it too. You know, the way that God prescribes the death penalty is he says, look, the people that hurt it, their hands are going to be first on them. And this is a way, the, the way that God administers these punishments, the way it's supposed to be administered is really designed to be preventative of this ever happening to begin with. If you had to be involved even in just, in just executing someone in death penalty, for one, you have to really hate sin. You have to have the mindset of saying, you, you have to understand this person deserves this punishment because God's name is holy. God's name does not deserve to be drug around through the mud. You know, he's our savior. He's the one that saves us out of problems. We are not going to tolerate anybody blaspheming his name. And this is what God says. God uh, demands his name is holy. And we'll see that in scripture in a little bit. Turn if you would to 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's a serious sin, blasphemy. But again, we're going to go over a few instances of blasphemy, but it's not exactly the same as taking the Lord's name in vain. They're two different things. But we need to understand both of them because they're both very important. They're both equally important on blaspheming God's name. This is what God has prescribed, the death penalty. If you blaspheme the name of God, you deserve to die. That's the mind of the Lord that was given unto Moses. 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, look at verse number 13. This is when David is confronted by Nathan about his sin. Remember he, his, his sin where he committed adultery with Bathsheba and he had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. He ordered his death. So he committed adultery and then murder. And Nathan confronts him and he gives him this story about a man and a sheep and, you know, and, and everything else. And he says, look, you're the man, David. That's you. And David's like, that guy needs to be put to death. And Nathan's like, that's you. You are that man. You're the one that deserves that punishment. Verse number 13 says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, this isn't David blaspheming the Lord, but what he's done, the reason why God's, uh, one of the reasons why God's upset about this, besides the actual sins he committed, he said, on top of all of that you've done that's wicked, now you've just opened up the door for the enemies of the Lord to just blaspheme his name. Oh, yeah, he's such a great Christian, right? And he's going around and committing adultery and committing murder. And that's the way that God's going to look at you. You know, when you don't live up, to the standards that you believe in, that the Bible teaches, when you go out and you get caught up in these sins and, and, and it's just 
public knowledge or people just come, you know, he tried to hide his sin, which he shouldn't have sinned in the first place, but then it just, you know, that which is done in secret is going to be made known. Okay? And don't think you're going to be getting away with sin because you're hiding it. But when, when your sin finds you out, look, people are going to use that against you and say, oh, so that's what a Christian is. And they're going to use that to be able to blaspheme God's name and bring God's holy name down because you are representing God out here. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And when you are a horrible ambassador because you're just involved in all kinds of sin, that lowers God's name and it gives people the opportunity to blaspheme. Just like the atheists, right? that will continue to mock God and, and, and they always will jump at the chance to see a Christian when they fall, when they backslide, when they get involved with sin and then they'll just, they'll just use that as an open door to just start their onslaught of blaspheming against God. And we should have no part in that whatsoever. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, even if you're not the one blaspheming, you're causing that, that to happen. But just to understand what blasphemy is, again, because of his sin, he's opening up the door for people to blaspheme. It's, it's, it's for them to bring God's name down and to lower it to a standard and, and revile his name and things like that. That's blasphemy. Look at Revelation chapter 2. We're going to see another form of blasphemy. They all have, I mean, blasphemy is like the same definition but there's multiple ways you can blaspheme God's name, if that makes sense. So blaspheming God's name is really just bringing his name down and lowering it and having disregard for it, disrespect unto God's name. That's what you're doing when you blaspheme God. But there's different ways you could go about doing it. You could curse God, right? You, could, you can literally just, just out and out just, just curse the name of the Lord. Or... Um, you can use other people's example and say, oh yeah, who is this God? And you know, if that's what his people do, you know, you blaspheme God's name that way. Or like in Revelation 2, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And this is an, a reference to the Jews who say they're Jews, but in God's eyes, they're not Jews because a Jew is not one which is a Jew outwardly, but one that's inwardly. It's not your outward flesh. It doesn't have to do with your physical seed of Abraham. It's if you're a spiritual seed of Abraham. That's the way God considers, are you one of his chosen people? Are you a Jew inwardly, spiritually? That's exactly what he's saying here. But there's those that call themselves Jews because they think that their physical uh, genealogy is important and they claim to be Jews it says but they're the synagogue of Satan they blaspheme they blaspheme God and one of the ways that the, the biggest way they blaspheme God is by saying that Jesus was not the Christ and they say many other things that are blasphemous I mean you look at the Talmud you look at all the things that they believe in and it's extremely blasphemous about Jesus I mean even about Jesus Christ they'll say Jesus Christ was a, a bastard son and his father, you know, that, that essentially they call his mother a whore and the, his father was some, some Roman soldier and named Pantera and, and that he's just a bastard son. Talk about blasphemy. That's right. Our Lord who was born of a virgin conceived of the Holy Ghost they reduce to a bastard. That is, that is blasphemy. You want to know what blasphemy is? That's a great definition of blasphemy right there. When you say those things about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that is blasphemy. Um, I'll run through. You can follow along with if you want. There's a bunch of Psalms I'm going to go through where God just, just explains. We're going to start in Psalm 99. God explains how holy his name is and how much his name is to be lifted up. The name of the Lord is holy, it's important, and we ought not to be dragging it through the mud or disrespecting God's name. Because that's what blasphemy does. Psalm 99 verse 3 says, Let them praise thy great and terrible name. For it is holy. Talking about the name. The name is holy. Psalm 103, 
Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Holy means it's set apart, it's sanctified, it's separate, it's above every other name. Psalm 105, Psalm 105, look at verse number 3. Psalm 105, 3 reads, Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. And then Psalm 111, excuse me, Psalm 111, verse number 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. And I just want to point out real quick, you know, the reason why we don't call the pastor or minister a reverend because God's name is reverend and it's reverenced and has nothing, you know, like I, you shouldn't, you know, you can respect a pastor, but, but I don't want to be called reverend. So, so don't ever call another man reverend. We call God reverend. Reverend is his name. Holy and reverend is his name. But that's not any man on this earth other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, you know, and it may just seem like a, a little thing, but it's, you know, it's important. All, all the words and titles and things that we use have meanings. And we try to, to use scriptural words. The Bible never refers to a pastor as being a reverend. Now, a minister, yes, because you're ministering to other people. You're working for them. You're helping them out. A pastor, yes, because you're watching over the flock of the local church. But not a reverend. My name is not to be exalted up. I'm just a man. And that's what, what God said here. His name is holy. His name is reverend. We need to give respect unto his name. And you don't have to turn it, but in Isaiah 57, verse 15, the Bible says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, Many people will, th will, will hear these examples that we just gave of blasphemy and they'll think that that sounds like they're taking the Lord's name in vain. They'll just, they hear that and they'll say, well, yeah, they took the Lord's name and they, you know, they're breaking the Ten Commandments. But that's not what that commandment means. Is it wicked and sinful and, and worthy of death according to the Bible? The blasphemy? Of course it is. But taking the Lord's name in vain, I'll read the commandment for you again from Exodus 20. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And the key word there is in vain. The key words. Vain means meaningless. It means for no reason at all. That's what vain is. Vanity, you know, when people look at themselves in the mirror and you say they're real vain, they're real into themselves, you know, it's, it's just meaningless. Because what, <laughs> they're not that great, right? Nobody is. But, but anything, if you, and here's, a, here's a good example. In James chapter 4, just understand the word vain itself, just, just, just how it's used, especially in the Bible, showing that it's just meaningless or for no good reason. In James chapter 4, verse number 5, the Bible reads, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So he's saying, do you think that this verse is in the Bible just for no reason at all? Do you think the scripture just saith in vain that the spirit dwelleth in us, lusteth to envy? He's saying, do you think that's just in there for no reason? That's what vain means. So let's apply that to the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain, right? Just try to think of an example. How can a person take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? Because that's what the commandment says. Well, that would be something where you're taking God's name. You're using God's name just for no real reason, for no good reason. And this is what people don't understand today because this is one of the Ten Commandments. But how often do you hear people say, oh my God? Now, you say, what? That's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Okay, are you speaking to God when you make an exclamation like that? Maybe you see something happen and it shocks you. When you just say, oh my God. If you're not saying, oh my God, and talking to God about something, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. There is no reason for you to be using God's name, God's holy name, just as an expression. 
Just because something happened, <gasps> oh my God. When people say that, that is using his name in vain. Or how about this one? When people say, Jesus Christ. And that's even worse because now, not only are they just using it in vain, but now they're using it more as an expletive. Because normally when people say that, they're upset, they're angry, and when they would normally use maybe some other four-letter word, they're going to cast in the name of our Savior and just, just say His name. And it's interesting how many atheists will use the name of Jesus Christ. Like, why do you even say His name? You don't even believe in God. You don't believe in Jesus, yet you seem to use His name all the time. Are you talking to Jesus? Are you, are you, you know... The only other thing that you can do where it's not going to be vain is if you're talking about him. So the reason why I'm standing up here and giving these examples because I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Obviously, I'm getting the point across. I'm not using his name in vain, just explaining what these are. But we need to understand that when you say these things, when you use these expressions, you are taking God's holy name in vain for no reason. What is the reason when you stub your toe or when you get a paper cut or whatever that you have to say, oh my God, or, or Jesus why do you have to say those things? Why can't you just say something else? Why do you have to use God's holy name and bring it down to the level of a curse word? That's right. Or how about this? People say, oh God, or dear God, or I mean, fill in the blank. You've heard all these things before. This is taking the Lord's name in vain. We just read all of those verses about how holy God's name is and what God thinks about his name. So when you reduce his name to an expression or even worse, like a cuss word, you know, you're guilty of breaking the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain. Now we saw how holy God's name is. It's worthy of dignity. It's worthy of our respect and ought not to be thrown around loosely or casually. And this is why I also... I don't even believe that we should be using euphemisms for God's name. And, you know, go ahead and disagree with me all you want to do, but I don't think that we should even be saying, oh my gosh. Okay? Now look, is gosh the name of God? No. But what does gosh mean? What is, go what is a gosh? Can someone just tell me what a gosh is? Because I've never, I don't know it. I mean, I, I, this is a book. This is a piece of paper. What's a gosh? A gosh is a God with a SH instead of a D. That's all it is. It's people really just not wanting to break this commandment, but they just want to say it anyways. So in your heart, what are you saying? Just out of your lips, you're, you're saying instead of a D, you just go SH. Is that really necessary? Now look, you may say, no, well, that's not a sin. Look, why would you even want to come so close to that line of what of breaking one of God's commandments that you just I mean why do you have to say that why there's so you could say just about anything in the world why do you have to make it so close to something that is just completely throwing using God's name in vain or people it irritates me so much people are OMG these days now it's they, they, just, they just use the letters and said now look when people use it, I believe they're using the name of the Lord in vain. That's right. Because what does the G stand for? What does the O and M? I mean, you can say, oh, but they're just letters. Yeah, but you're, there's a meaning behind what you're saying. People know what you're saying when you, just, when you just shorten it. Just because it's a contraction doesn't mean that those, those words aren't what you're referring to. You're still using the name. How about this one? G's. Again, what's a G's? It's a Jesus without the U.S. That's what a G's is. We need to think about the words that we use. The words that we use are very important. The things that come out of your mouth. We, we saw this morning, you know, evil communication corrupt good manners. When you start using the Lord's name in vain, you just use these words and say, well, I don't know. I just say it because I've heard it growing up. Okay, is that a really good reason to just use words? No. And look, look, I understand. I'm guilty of saying these things in the best. I've done these things. But that's why I'm preaching about them today is because you need to, to, you need to be able to um, 
take ownership for what comes out of your mouth and not say stupid things, and especially things that are be breaking God's commandments. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 12. We're going to see how important this really is. The words that we speak, the words that we use are very important. They all have meaning. We need to be able to retrain. If you're guilty of this, if it's something that happens by habit, I get it, but you need to train yourself to change what you say. You have to do it. Or just continue to be in sin. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse number 36. The Bible says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We see how important our words are. Now look, in context, I believe this scripture is talking about people who are not saved, people not received. I don't think that we're going to be judged according to, you know, to bad things that we've said once you're already saved and all of your sins are forgiven. You know, God's not going to then, then in heaven berate you for, for the sins that you've committed in this lifetime, just to be fair. But the reason why I'm going to this scripture is to point out the importance of our words. Because even, especially for the unsaved people, every idle word, that means it's just the meaningless things that you say. People think, ha ha, yeah, whatever, I don't believe in God and all this other stuff. And, and they'll just let their mouth just, just spew things out. They're going to be judged for every single one of those idle words. Every time they use the name Jesus Christ, every time they use the name of the Lord in vain. And how many people, I know, I can't even think of how many people I know that are, that, that are not saved, that are guilty of this. And they're going to be, you know, those words are going to come back to haunt them. I wish they'd never done that. We need to, to as a Christian community, it, it, I wish it could just be known again that people even understood that this is what this commandment is talking about. When people understand, a lot of times people who are not even believers will often be afraid of, of breaking certain commandments because they still have some semblance of like, well, the Bible says this and they kind of think it's right and, and they don't want to do things that are that bad. They want to be a good person. And, you know, if more people just understood this, this is, this is something that's contagious, that catches on, especially in a culture, and especially with the TV. You, know, you hear certain words all the time, and all of a sudden people are repeating it, and it spreads like wildfire. And people need to understand that this is a very serious sin. It's, a, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Not to take the name of the Lord in vain. So if you're not talking to God, and if you're not talking specifically about God, don't use His name. There's no reason for it. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 6. We're going we're gonna to switch gears now. We're about halfway through the sermon. We're going to switch gears. That's, it's a real simple commandment. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Very simple. There shouldn't be, there's not a whole lot to really dig into on that commandment other than just don't do it. If you're going to use God's name for any reason, um, only do it for a reason of speaking to Him or speaking about Him. Now we're going to go on. I'll read for you from Exodus 20, 12. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, this commandment was not given just for children. We often read this and think, Honor thy father and mother. And you're thinking, well, this must be talking about kids, and they need to obey their parents. Now, are children ought to obey their parents? Of course they should But this, is, this command wasn't given just for children to obey their parents. We need to be honoring our... I mean, he's given this commandment to Moses, who is an adult, and he's giving it to the congregation. And there's a lot more involved to this commandment than just children obeying. obeying. You know, it's, not just, it's not just children be obedient unto your parents. It's honor thy father and thy mother. And this really is an important doctrine. And I encourage you to... to to go and check out the entire sermon I preached because I'm kind of just going to recap some of the major points that I hit before. But there this one really is worthy of its own sermon because this has to do with our family. 
And the family is so under attack these days. And, and the strength and the unity that we ought to have in our families in honoring and respecting your mother and your father and, and um, treating them with, with the dignity that they deserve, you know, we're, we're, we're very quickly and rapidly declining so morally that we have children these days of all ages that just don't care about their parents and nothing to do with them. Yeah, I don't want to listen to anything you have to say. Children and adults, just, just real flipping, real disrespectful to their own parents. And um, we're in Ephesians 6. We'll just cover the children real quick because it does apply to both. Honoring your father and mother. If you have a father and mother, this applies to you, regardless of your age. Ephesians 6, verse 1, the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, what Ephesians 6 is explaining here is saying, Look, children, you need to obey your parents in the Lord. You need to listen to what mom and dad is saying at home and do what they're telling you to do. And he brings up this commandment, honor thy father and mother. And he points out, he says, which is the first commandment with promise. So what's neat about this specific commandment is that it comes with a promise, a promise of good things. If you obey this commandment, things are actually going to go well for you. Not only are things not going to go bad for you, right? Like if you obey the commandment not to murder, well, the good thing that's going to happen is that nothing bad will happen as a result of you murdering someone, right? But, but God doesn't give you like a special blessing like, hey, good job, you didn't murder anybody. But this commandment comes with a promise. This commandment says that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. So he's saying if you can honor your father and mother, your days, things will go well for you and that you can live long on this earth. You can avoid a lot of hardship and a lot of problems and a lot of struggles by obeying your mother and father, listening to them and giving respect unto their words. Because kids especially, guess what? You may think that you know a lot as you grow up. You start to learn more and you feel like you, you, you know so much. And you are, you're learning a lot, but your parents are so much older than you and have been through so much more. You need to listen to what they say because guess what? We were all kids at one point too. Right. We've all been there. We know what it's like to be three or four or five. I don't remember three, but you know, <laughs> we know what it's like to be a young child. Five, six, seven. We've been there. We've been through all the different struggles. And as we've grown older, we've learned a lot more than you have. And sometimes you don't understand why we give you certain rules. But your mom and dad love you. And they want what's best for you. And they care more about you than you might, might even realize. And it's all the more important to honor them and respect them. And when they say something, to listen to what they say. And God says, if you can do that, if you can listen to mom and dad, if you can listen to what they have to say, things will go well for you. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon is, is the author of majority of those, of those Proverbs. And he's giving instruction unto his son. Over and over again, you'll see, my son, my son, listen to my instruction. You know, listen to these words. Bind them about your heart. You know, put them in front of your eyes all the time. Listen to what I'm teaching you. This is very, very important. Girls, sit down. This is very important. You need to understand these great truths. Please get this through your head and it'll, be, it'll give you wisdom and you can, you can live long and you can avoid all of these things that maybe your parents have done that were wrong in the past. You can avoid those things if you can just listen early on. Mom and dad might have made all kinds of mistakes. You don't have to make those mistakes. It'll go well with you. Now look, this doesn't just stop for, the, for a, a, a lower age child. Even us as adults can learn from the wisdom and experience of our own parents. They're much older than us. They've been around on this earth longer. Now, 
There's a lot of wisdom you can gain from the Bible, and hopefully you gain this wisdom without having to go through it. But there's also wisdom that we gain just through experience, by going through things. And hopefully you don't have to always go through things in order to gain that wisdom and that knowledge. And I think this is one of the reasons why this is the first commandment with promise. Is because if we can adhere to that, if we could recognize, hey, I'm going to respect and listen to things that my parents say and, and you know, they are looking out for me. They love me. I'm going to listen to what they say. Now, as an adult, obviously, it doesn't mean your parents are always right, but you respect what they have to say because they love you. They care about you. They're older than you. They have a lot more experience. So I'm going to listen to what they have to say. I'm going to give them respect. And if you're, if you're a young child, if you're living at home with your parents, you better just obey them and do what they tell you to do so that it is well with you. Now, that word honor, we're going to go into this a little bit, actually has a couple of different meanings. Honor can mean respect. And that's most commonly what, what we're talking about when it says honor thy father and mother. You're saying respect them. You know, and a proper respect is tied in with a proper fear. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at Hebrews 12, 28. Now with children, in or, you know, one of the reasons why my children will respect me and listen to what I have to say is because they know that if they don't, there's going to be a punishment. There's going to be a spanking that they're going to receive because they're being disobedient and they're not listening. And they will respect the things that you say more when you give them proper discipline. And this is evident. Just look, in, look at the stores. Go When you go out in public and you see the child that, that goes nuts and throws these fits and everything else, because their parents don't discipline them. They don't respect what they have to say. So when a, you, know, you see a child, they're throwing a fit and they're hitting people and throwing stuff all over the place and just completely out of control. And mom's going, okay, Johnny, come back over here, Johnny. Come back here. I mean it. They have no respect for what their mother is saying to them or their father or whoever because they don't have the proper fear. Children need to have that proper fear and we need to have the proper fear of the Lord because guess what? God is, if you're saved today, God is your father in heaven. You are his child. You're his son or his daughter. He is your father and we need to have a healthy fear of God. And it's not just respect. One of the reasons we respect God is because we also need to fear him. You're in Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Wherefore we... Receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Look at this. With reverence and godly fear. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. God isn't just a puffball. God is extremely loving and merciful to the point of our salvation, giving it to us for a free gift because he loves us. But God will discipline us. He's a consuming fire. He also has anger. He's angry with the wicked every day. And if we decide to just, just ignore God and ignore His commandments and say, well, I'm just going to take the name of the Lord man anyways. He's going to come down on you. You need to have that fear of God saying, God, I don't know what you're going to do if I do this. And I don't want to know. I'm going to obey you because... I know that you are a consuming fire and that you are powerful. I don't want you raining down on me. And the reason why he, do, he would do that is because he loves you. And I'm not, you, know, you could go through this for yourself, but in the book of Proverbs, it explains the proper disciplining of your child and how if you spare your rod, you hate your child. But if you, if you chase them at times, you know, basically if you beat them with the rod, the Bible says you will save their soul from hell. And the reason it says that is because they need to understand there are consequences for our actions. There is bad consequences when you break the rule, when you break God's laws 
And when you break, when you break mom and dad's laws, you get punished. And it's going to sting. It's going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. It's not something you're ever going to want to do again because it hurts. But it teaches you that when we break God's laws, you might not feel that spanking right away. You might think you got away with it. But God knows and sees everything. And God has one punishment of hell on all of our sins. We need to understand, hey, that's real. God will punish the wicked. He'll punish the sinners. If you have not received Christ and, and Christ's payment covers that for you, then that's what you are going to pay. And it's understanding when you're brought up from a young age, you can get that through your head that there are consequences for our actions. Hell is a real place. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. It exists. It's in the heart of the earth. There's fire and burning and brimstone and torture and torment in that place. And it's a punishment for sin. We need to have that healthy fear and respect unto God's laws and unto God's name. Um, and that we need to honor our Father in heaven. But um, there's another, another meaning for that. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 5. There's another different meaning for, um, for honor. And I actually think that this has more to do with that verse than respect. The meaning that we're going to see here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 of this word honor. Uh, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Honor widows that are widows indeed. And then the chapter continues on. It kind of explains who really is a widow. And it's, you know, they have to be a certain age and they have to have done good things. You know, there, there's all these qualifications for who's a widow indeed. But then jump down to verse number 16. Because verse 3 says to honor them. Right? Well, what does that mean? Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows. Indeed, relieving is you're taking care of them. You are caring for these widows. Why would you have to take care of a widow? Um, because they're a widow. Because they have nobody else to take care of them. And they say, well, if they have family members, let the family members take care of them. That's the family's job. You know, if someone's lost a wife or lost a husband and they're not working, they're a little bit older, you know, they're elderly, they can't support themselves, they need someone to help them. You don't run to the government. That's what the family's for. And look, if the family can't do it or if there is no family, you know, there, there's no one else around that can help out, that's where the church comes in. So that the church can relieve them. When you show honor to them, you're not just like standing up when they walk in, which is one way of respecting someone. But what this, in this context, what he's talking about is taking care of them financially. Taking care of them, you know, getting them food, whatever they need, helping them out. And this was one of the problems when uh, the church got real big at Jerusalem. And the, the Greeks, they were getting upset because they were saying, hey, look, nobody's, nobody's looking to our widows. And that's when they had to appoint seven men to go out and, and do that business. And they're saying, you know, to, to actually go out and, and, you know, use the church funds and go out and help these people out and take care of them and, and make sure that they're cared for. Because they're widows, they needed help. And... Um, that's that role, but let's keep reading because it continues on then about widows being honored. That's what it's talking about. Verse number 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. We're going to see a little bit more further proof that when it's talking about honor, it's talking about taking care of or like, like financially, for example. I mean, just in, in their needs. Whatever that may be, I mean, if it's, if it's food, you know, if you bring them food or bring them money or whatever, you know, whatever's going to help out their situation, that's the honor that they get. Because look at verse 18, it says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. This is talking about an elder in the church, someone who's a pastor, an elder. Look, if they're doing a very good job of in their role of pastor, if they're, you know, working in the Word, winning souls, getting converts, teaching, training, doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. Hey, look, if they're doing that well, they're worthy of double honor. That's what the Bible says. And he's saying, look, 
You know, you have an ox that you're using to do all this, this hard work and treading out the corn. You don't muzzle the ox. You let them eat of it at least. Well, when the pastor's out and trying to, to, to help build God's church and get people saved and do all this hard work, look, the money's coming in, tithes, offerings, everything else. Pay him. Just, just take care of him. Take care of his needs. He says the laborer is worthy of his reward. He's working real hard. He deserves it. This is what we see in honoring. Now turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. Because this, this, all, this all ties together perfectly. It makes perfect sense. You could see this. You should be able to see this from Scripture. That, and, and this is what we're going to see, especially in Mark chapter 7, how honoring your father and mother, I think that commandment has more to do with the taking care of for the adults to take care of their adult parents in this way even then it has to do with respect. I think it's applicable both ways, but I think this has even more to do with that commandment. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse number 10. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. He mentions the Mosaic law in in the commandment of honoring your father and mother, right? Look at verse number 11. But ye say, he's talking to the Pharisees, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught, which means anything, for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So he's saying, essentially what he's saying is, you are breaking this commandment of not honoring, of honoring your father and mother by excusing yourself from taking care of them or doing things for them. It says, what is it, you know, that it might be profited. What is profited talking about? Being, you know, increased. Financially, you, I mean, when you think of profit, that's what you're thinking of, right? He, they say, the, the Jews at that time, the Pharisees at that time would say, oh, well, whatever I do for you, consider that a gift. As opposed to being their duty, their responsibility, obeying God's commandments to take care of your parents. They're saying, well, whatever I do for you, just, just consider that a gift. You're lucky if I do something for you. That was their attitude. And Jesus Christ said, you are making the word of God of none effect by your traditions. This is what the commandment's talking about. Jesus Christ explained it perfectly. We see the other examples of honor as we, as we already saw. And then we see Jesus Christ's explanation of how they're breaking that commandment. Again, I still think that, that it's applicable to say we need to respect our parents because it's all tied together. I mean, when you respect your parents, when you listen to what they have to say, you're going to, you know, it, and then you take care of them. It, it all is part of that family um, bond and, and, and treating them the way they ought to be treated and, and having a, a, a strong family. Because family is supposed to look out for each other. I just preached about this when we were going through our, our series on Genesis when Abram went, even though Lot was in sin, Lot was in Sodom, Lot made a lot of bad choices in his life, but what happened when he was taken captive? Did Abram say, oh, well, pff, he deserved that. I'm not going to go help him out. No, Abram got his servants and went and fought four kings that had just defeated five kings and rescued Lot. His nephew. Why? Because it's his family. Because it's his duty. Because that was something that he was going to do. We need to honor our fathers and mothers. We need to give them respect. We need to strengthen our families in 2015. And not just, just treat it as just some people. Satan knows the power of a family. You, have, you should have strong bonds. And that is going to be very difficult to break down. You, could get, you draw strength from your family. They're there for you in your time of need. 
which is why he's been attacking it at all fronts. He wants you weak and separated. He's trying to separate husbands and wives. He's trying to separate children from their parents. That's why all the, I mean, this whole world is crazy with, with, with the institutions and the government and the government schools and breaking up the kids and then having the family, the, the husband and the wife both out at work and everybody's away from each other, not able to spend time with each other to build your family and be strong. That's Satan's agenda. We need to keep ourselves strong as a family. Amen. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 9, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. That's how God feels about, about how you ought to respect your parents. He said, if you curse your father or mother, they should be put to death. People like to mock that. The atheists will be like, oh yeah, you believe you should be put a disobedient child to death and they twist the scripture and that's not what it actually says. But when you're cursing, like telling your mom or your dad to go to hell or some other similar curse like that, that's worthy of death. That's wicked. You need to re respect your parents for bringing you into this world and raising your stinking butt for however many years they do it and feeding you and clothing you and changing you and doing everything, taking care of you. You need to give them that respect. Now, does that mean every parent is a great parent in this world? No. But the Bible says, honor your father and mother. It doesn't say unless they treat you bad. It doesn't say that. It says you honor your father and your mother. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 20, whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp, shall be put out in obscure darkness. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 30. God places an extreme importance on the honor that is to be given to the parents, as, as we've been seeing with all of these scriptural references. When the family structure that God has designed breaks down, you end up with an extremely wicked society, which is what we're seeing today. Proverbs 30 gives us a perfect picture of the wickedness that is going on today. Proverbs 30, look at verse number 11. Proverbs 30, verse 11, the Bible reads, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. This is a wicked society. People who, you know, there's this generation that's coming up that's willing to curse their father, not to bless their mother. They're lifted up in their own pride, and they think that I'm so good, and I'm so great, and they don't realize how wicked and filthy they really are. They're not washed from their wickedness. They think that they can do no wrong. It's a proud heart, a proud attitude that knows everything else better than their parents, better than you, better than, better than everybody else, better than that Bible. And what are they filled with? Violence. It says their teeth are as swords. They're brutal. They're, they're ruthless. And it says their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from out. They, they, they prey on the weak, on the poor and the needy, heartless. There's a generation like that. And, and what I think of about that is, in, is the reprobates uh, that, that seem to be increasing more and more these days. In Romans 1, do you get that whole litany in Romans 1 that describes the attribute of a reprobate? And you hear all these different things, you know, haters of God. One of the things that it lists, besides their proud and boasters and all this other stuff, is disobedient to parents. That's one of their attributes. They don't honor their parents. They don't honor their father and their mother. This is an attribute of a reprobate. We ought not to display an attribute of a reprobate. Someone who's rejected of God. We need to make sure that we are, are 
staying true to God's words and His commandments and that, hey, I know this. Whenever my parents, if my mother or my father are ever come in a time of need, whatever I can do is what I'm going to do to help them. I will never turn my back on them, on my family. I will help them as my family. And look, do we agree on everything? No. Okay? <laughs> no, we don't. But I have respect unto them. They brought me in this world. They, hey, hey, they're great. Look, I don't want to make it sound like I'm bad mother like my parents either because they're great to me. I, I've been blessed with a loving, you know, parents. But we don't agree with everything, especially when it comes to the Bible and God. But regardless of all of that, I will take care of them. That is my duty and response and my wife's family. We will take care of them to the best of our ability. Now, it's not like we're living in the lap of luxury, but you don't need to have tons of money to take care of somebody. They can come into our house and we'll do whatever we can. We can feed them and glow them, whatever their needs may be. That's what we're going to do because that's what God has commanded. And that's what we're teaching our children to, to have a tight, strong family, people you can always rely on to be there for you because we need that. And, that, and as a church, we ought to have the same exact thing. Your church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be there for each other in, in other people's times of need. Extend that beyond just your physical family unto God's family. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your commandments. I pray that you would please help us to apply this wisdom in our lives, dear Lord, and that we would be able to look at your commandments in a good light and in, in, in the, in the, be able to apply it in our personal lives, dear Lord, in our personal family situations, dear God, in the way that we speak, that we wouldn't just take the na your name in vain and just toss it around like it's meaningless, like it's not a name that's above every name. Um, we pray that you would please just help us if that's a problem in our life to be able to correct that swiftly and just be able to, to replace words with, with your, just replace a phrase completely with something else or just not even say anything. I don't understand why we always feel like we have to say something all the time. Let's, let's keep our idle words to a minimum. God, we love you and we want to show honor unto you and, that, and also honor unto our own um, parents, if they are still alive, our fathers and mothers, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to have a, a spirit that is a, one of respect and one where we are willing to do whatever is necessary to help out our family members when they're in a time of need, the same way that, that you look out for us as your children, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.